Yeah. All right, hi guys, my name's Rebecca. I'm doing a presentation on the school to prison pipeline from education to incarceration. So before we talk about the subject, I wanna make sure we talk about the 13th Amendment. So what you guys may or might not know is, basically it says you can't be held as a slave unless you are a criminal, basically, is the only way that you can have your rights taken away. So you're no longer free. So also I wanna say that many state prisons are required to keep prisons filled even though no one is committing a crime because it's a heavy, heavily monetized system. We now have more African Americans under criminal supervision than all the slaves back in the 1850s also. So huge thing with race, huge thing with poverty. In addition to that, we're gonna to touch on some zero tolerance policy, the war on drugs, the creation of social labels, and how we facilitate the flow of people of color, poverty, and the foster system through a pipeline from school to prison. Um, so why does this matter to me? I currently work at the Boulder County Jail as my internship, uh, and I've been volunteering there over a year before this. Um, in my undergrad, I did my thesis on basically feminist and civil rights issues, which is when I came across that, you know, they crave injustice with uh, the reform system, or lack thereof. I also wanna work with youth in the system once I graduate. I plan on uh, maybe working in an alternative school, maybe kids that are currently incarcerated in kid prison, something like that. I also wanna be in, um, involved in politics in the future to help change these from the top down. Uh, would love to be Elizabeth Warren one day, be a senator, that'd be great, so we'll see what happens. And also just many of the adults I work with at the jail currently, you know, started this cycle when they were like 12 to 14. You know, I hear a lot of them, they've been arrested and incarcerated like over 20 times. So it starts really young, so that's where we have to address a lot of these problems. So if you guys wanna flip your hand out over, I put this graphic on it. So are our children being punished into prison? So 40% of the students expelled from US schools each year are black. And if you look here at the bottom, black or Latino only makes up 30% of the population. Also, 68% of all males in state and federal prisons do not have a high school diploma. So there's a huge link there between education and being incarcerated. Also, 70% of inmates in California state prison are former foster care youth. So that shows the huge attachment uh, disruption and cycle that can happen when you have no support system and how the incarceration rate increases. Also here at the bottom, one out of three African American males will be incarcerated in their lifetime. One out of six Latino males will be incarcerated and that's compared to one out of 17 white males. So we need to address these needs, you know, this ki these kids' needs in school because it's really not guaranteed anywhere else that they're gonna show up every day. You know, there's great safety nets at libraries, YMCA's, other rec centers, but it's not a promise they'll show up and get what they need or their parents will. So school's one of the only places they're day in and day out. So let's meet their needs there if nowhere else. You know, like uh, clothes, shoes, as well as school supplies, food to take home over weekends or long breaks. Um, and we also need more trained staff in counseling and mental health to help out with behavior and distress. When kids are hungry, cold, or stuck in trauma, you know, learning's impossible to take place. So unfortunately, it's up to the public education system to try to meet these needs if our government isn't gonna do it elsewhere. And ideally, we need to start noticing these children who need help and could fall victim to the pipeline system as early as elementary school, because it's shown that the most uh, heavily expulsion rate is usually between the ages of three and six. So why is this happening? A lot of times there's unaddressed learning disabilities. These kids are coming from homes with neglect and abuse. We're having failing public schools, zero tolerance policies and other severe discipline practices. We have a lot of punitive education going on. Of course, the war on drugs that happened in the 80s and is still continuing. Poverty, race, policing in schools, and a lot of times these officers have little to no training with youth. Uh, we also have created disciplinary alternative schools. Uh, from the research I've done, but about between 10 and 20% of alternative schools are pretty healthy modeled, but the majority are not, and they focus on a disciplinary view. Also, of course, childhood trauma, the expulsion and susp suspension rates, the foster system, also I wanna go into a little bit more, denied protections in court. So youth who become involved in the juvenile justice system are often denied procedural protections in courts. In one state, up to 80% of court-involved children do not have lawyers. So students are committing minor offenses, 
They usually end up in a secure detention facility. They're released on probation, but then they, uh, you know, violate their probation with missing school, disobeying teachers, really minor infractions. And of course, it's hard to reverse the cycle once it's started. So many students are propelled down the pipeline from school to jail. It's difficult for them to make that journey in reverse. So once they enter the juvenile system, there's a lot of barriers for reentry back into traditional schools. So the vast majority never gra graduate from high school. And a lot of that's because they were displaced from school. So it's really hard to integrate back at grade level once you've been out for so long. So I want to tell the story behind this picture. I got a ticket for armed robbery when I was 12. The foster parents I had would hit me and my little sister. We ran, but we didn't have any place to stay because my brother was in lockup. I was running away when I was eight and my sister was six. The foster father I had sexually abused us and then to get back at him, we would hit their children. My mom was getting affiliated. When she heard my foster parents were hitting me, she showed up with a gun. So the police put an order on us because they thought she would be a danger. Both my parents are gang members. They never fed us. They were selling drugs out of our house and we would be wandering down the streets with my brother and sister looking for food. JW, age 15. So I wanna talk briefly um, about this graphic. This really just explains uh, the rates and genders of those who are incarcerated uh, per 100,000 juveniles. So you can see non-Hispanic black and American Indian, pretty disproportionate rates, especially compared to whites over here on the side. Also, you can see the levels between uh, females and males, and males clearly get incarcerated a lot more often. So this is the wall of shame at the Miami-Dade Regional Juvenile Detention Center. These are mugshots of kills uh, of kids that were released from the center and then later killed by gunshot wounds. Expired indicates deceased. Um, in reading a little bit about this picture, it seemed to me that these officers were kind of mocking these kids you know, for fucking up, ending up in their custody, and then leaving and getting shot. So it's like super disappointing that these are the, you know, the people who are put in charge of rehabilitating our kids when they're really excited that they die almost. And while looking at this picture, I kind of just want to talk a little bit about the link between the ACE study and offenders. So ACE is Adverse Childhood Experiences. So they did this with kids in Florida. Um, I think it was right around 65,000 kids they surveyed, so it was a pretty large number. Um, they um, surveyed, and only 2.8% reported no childhood adversity, compared with 34% of the general population. So that means uh, they had to report at least one, and so only three, about 3% didn't. Also, half of the Florida juveniles reported four or more ACEs, compared with only 13% of the general population. So people with four or more ACEs are more likely to be smokers, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, seven times more likely to be alcoholic, and 10 times more likely to inject street drugs. Also higher ACE scores have a higher risk to reoffend and offend in the first place. So this study shows that youth in the juvenile system were indeed victims of child abuse, neglect, dysfunctional homes prior or concurrent being with incarcerated. So this explores a little bit more of the war on drugs if you can see right here in 1970, about 350,000 people were incarcerated. That number hugely jumped by 1990, and the war on drugs is right at the beginning of the 80s. And then by 2014, 2.3 million are incarcerated. Also, fun fact, Obama was the only sitting president to ever visit a prison. And the US is 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. So we're leading in that area for sure. The story behind this picture. I've been here a week this time. I'm, I'm court ordered to stay isolated from other kids. I was in foster care for about 11 years and now I'm adopted. They got me for residential burglary when I was in the seventh grade. But since then it's been a lot of probation violations. Late for school, not appearing for my PO, stuff like that. Drug court probably saved my life. My mom is into drugs and my dad was deported to the Philippines. I have three sisters but we're all split up. The only person who visits me is my YMCA drug counselor. Lunch, it was junk. CC, age 16. So are we failing our children? So out of the 49 million students that were enrolled in public schools at this time, 3.5 million were suspended in school and almost as many were suspended outside of school. And another 130,000 were expelled. 
Students with disabilities and students of color are disproportionately impacted by these practices. Black students are suspended and expelled at a rate of three times higher than white students, and students with disabilities at a rate of two times higher than non-disabled peers. So basically with these practices, we're taking them out of the possibly safest environment they have access to, because a lot of times these kids' homes aren't safe. So I just wanted uh, to quickly compare uh, public schools to alternative schools. And when I speak about alternative schools, I'm talking about the disciplinary ones, not just in general. So with public schools, some of the problems are displaced and low funding. You know, we have overcrowded classrooms, lack of qualified teachers, and insufficient funding for counselors, textbooks, special education services. So all this locks students into a second-rate educational environment. And I'm sure you guys have seen with the protests lately, what some teachers are dealing with, falling apart textbooks, cl broken classrooms, stuff like that. Also, teacher salary. In Colorado, it starts as low as 29000 to start as a teacher, which is insane. You know, how are you supposed to live off of that? And this is what we're paying for the people who are basically raising our children when we think it's okay to, you know, pay entertainers, football players, millions of dollars. You know, that should, probably should be reversed. Uh, zero tolerance policies. So this is where we criminalize minor infractions in schools. We can use the one strike and you're out policy. And school officials have to hand down specific, consistent, and harsh punishment, usually expansion, um, suspension or expulsion. And punishment applies regardless of circumstances. So if you got into a fight and it was self-defense, most of the time you're still suspended. We also have huge policing in the halls with cops that have no training. And many arrests are for nonviolent offenses and more for behavioral issues. So things that should actually be handled by the school aren't being handled by the school, and they're being handed to these cops. So, and of course, students of color are especially vulnerable to push out and uh, the discriminatory applica applications of discipline. So what are some of the consequences because of these things? You know, with lacking resources and a lot of these schools are facing incentives, of course, to push out low performing students. We use really harsh discipline practices to funnel these kids right into the juvenile system. So when these kids do get suspended or expelled, a lot of times they're left unsupervised, their, kid, their parents don't care, or they're not around because they're working. They don't have any constructive activities, and they easily fall behind in their coursework, which it leads to a greater um, likelihood of disengagement and dropout. Um, so with the alternative schools, disciplinary, so a lot of uh, students who have been expelled have no right to an education at all sometimes in certain districts and states or they're spent to a disciplinary alternative school. So these schools usually provide a meaningless education. They're shadow systems run by for-profit companies also, often. They have no accountability standards like minimum classroom hours and curriculum requirements. So basically they can do anything they want. So a lot of times they fail to provide a meaningful education to the students who usually need that most. So what are the consequences? Of course, already struggling students are you know, not returning to school prepared. A lot of times they get permanently locked into the setting or they're funneled through the setting right into the juvenile system. So the story behind this photo. This is the second time I've been here. I'm here for 10 days. The first time I was here for eight. I had a domestic violence with my auntie. Another time it was a DV in shoplifting. My sister grabbed a jacket from a store and threw it at me. My mom has alcohol problems. My auntie has legal custody, my dad's deceased. He died of um, throat cancer. I was 12. I'm in the eighth grade. I smoke now and then, even though my dad died of cancer. I'm here because I was in my room. I got angry and put the dresser against the door, and then went into the closet and went to sleep. My auntie called the police and told them I was planning on killing my younger brother, but that's not true. I just wanted a quiet place to sleep, so I went into the closet, but the police didn't believe me. MR, age 14. So how can we try to make these alternative schools a little better if kids are going to end up being sent there? So I kind of created a compassion model, which is based off of some positive um, alternative schools I've seen. So that includes a smaller class size, taking care of uh, emotional and physical wellness, learning coping skills, acceptance, resiliency, having positive, calm energy in the room, you know, having a sense of safety and feeling safe while you're learning. Also, just access to mental health, addiction counseling, having novelty movement and creativity and breaks in classes, and of course using mindfulness in all areas of the school and having all staff and faculty trained in that. Uh, another suggestion I have is to uh, screen all kids with the ACE study when they first come in to see if there's any additional help we can give them with trauma and all that kind of stuff. And as we said before, you know, providing uh, food and clothes and stuff if that's necessary 
And also having a trained nurse on staff at all times to help with physical illness, because a lot of times these kids don't get to go to the doctor because no one's there to take them. As well as uh, contraceptive health care, which is super important once we get to the older teenagers. So, juvenile justice in America currently. It was, um, juvenile court was created in Illinois in 1899. Soon after, recognizing that youth offenders had diminished liability and a stronger um, potential for rehabilitation, every state created its own juvenile court system. So then all other developed nations around the world then copied the American model at that time. But today, the US is an international outlier in the severity of its juvenile sentencing practices. Until 2005, the US was the only developed country that subjected children to the death penalty. And today, we're the only nation that sentences juveniles to life without parole. UN officials and other human rights organizations condemn the way America's, Americans treat children, the most vulnerable members of society. Many states abolish um, juvenile life without parole, including Colorado, which just happened last year, actually. We're going to be releasing a few hundred inmates in the next few years. And re, um, basically, we're training them to integrate back into society if they were sentenced to life without parole when they were kids. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has repeatedly determined that children are different in the eyes of the Constitution. As brain science tells us, children are less blameworthy and more responsive to rehabilitation. So why aren't we doing that? Also, in some states, children as young as six can be transferred out of the juvenile court system and into adult court without any judicial oversight. Also, these kids are still um, basically subjected to conditions of confinement, like solitary, 23-hour lockdown. Also, there's ongoing lawsuits in many states where youth inmates are housed with adults and have routinely been raped while prison officials turn a blind eye. So this is uh, YOS with its Youthful Offender Services. It's in Pueblo, Colorado. They're, um, so Colorado changed their law, so they're no longer called detention facilities for children, and they're usually called offender uh, services or systems to make it more of a focus on rehabilitation versus punishment for kids. It's so already kind of stepping in the right direction here. So basically, this is uh, for kids 14 uh, to 20 who were sentenced as adults while they were children. So they are able to serve their time and about a third of that time or less in this facility instead of being transferred to an adult facility and serving their full sentence. So they try to put a huge emphasis on rehabilitation. Some of their pra uh, practices are questionable, such as they make you go through a four-week boot camp where they break you before you're allowed to enter the program. Um, but they do try really hard with um, having kids drop out of gangs and how to counsel them through that. But unfortunately, you know, 82% of the YOS admissions are black or Hispanic youth. So that just shows a huge disproportionate amount compared to the white youth. And there's a couple concerns here. You know, there's not gender specific programming. Um, you know, the staff aren't totally trained to be trauma informed, stuff like that. I also just wanted to briefly mention, I went to Lookout Mountain Youth Services, which is in Golden. I toured there a couple weeks ago. And um, they're much on the step to the right direction. They have an entire mental health unit. They provide school eight hours a day. And they have mandatory um, group therapy after each school day, uh, depending on what your need is at that time, along with individual counseling that's available. So how can we approve these juvenile detention centers? All staff has to be trauma-informed, of course, and that includes asking, like, what happened to you versus what's wrong with you is the number one thing. You know, we have to help these kids. Many are homeless, emancipated, or without any parental supervision, you know, while incarcerated and once they get out. So, of course, we need to keep these youth out of adult jails and prisons, have separate sentencing. These kids have a higher chance of rehabilitation, so let's give it to them. Teaching victim impact, you know, we need to work on empathy skills. There's no such thing as a victimless crime. We need to have life skills classes. So teach them how to be adults since no one else is going to. You know, a job search, resume, how to cook, clean, do laundry, open bank accounts, just manage loans. Also making mini apartments instead of cells is less shocking to these kids' systems. So let's help them move forward instead of backwards. Also, you know, have access to general medical care, including dental and vision, which is often left out in these kind of environments. Uh, sexual health, mental health counselors, addiction specialists, gang dropout, and of course, mentors. Because connect connection is the most important thing we can do for these kids, especially since so many are from the foster system. So how do we help them engage in pro-social activities, spiritual practices, higher education, hooked up with good groups? 
Also, teaching of emotional regulation and other coping skills, DBT has uh, been shown to be one of the most effective treatments for teens. And also working with gender differences. You know, the justice system is reluctant to intervene with females until they reach a higher threshold of delinquency, since women tend to act inwardly instead of outwardly with their behaviors. Um, so I'm about out of time, but I want to go through real quick how it relates to therapy and everybody else. So of course, education touches all aspects of our life. It sets us up for success and, or failure. To get an education, we have to be healthy, both mentally and physically first. Also, one out of five people in America will serve time at one point in their life. So you're bound to have a client who has been arrested for some type of crime to come into your office. Children are our future. If we want to continue thriving as a country, we need to invest in fixing this problem. And everyone deserves a right to an equal and fair education. The Constitution says you have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if we don't provide that, we're violating that right. Education is a pathway out of poverty. You know, as a therapist, make sure you also understand your implicit bias, you know, your racial privilege, white privilege especially, and your socioeconomic privilege. Have training in trauma as well as attachment. And just remember to use no shaming behaviors because any one of us could end up in this situation. So anyone feeling hopeless? This is on your handout. Uh, I put two representatives that are local here. Also, you know, if you work in a school, how can you help make some policy changes, work with administration? If you're a parent, how can you work with their school, whatever your kids are in, help advocate for change? Um, and then, of course, if you're a therapist, you know, all the things we talked about, regulation, coping, how to get out of dangerous situations. Um, and I would just really quick wanted to give a shout out to the artist I used for all these photographs. His name is Richard Ross, and he's visited more than 200 institutions and spoke with over 1,000 juveniles and got their story and their photos. Thanks. Anybody have any questions? Comments, concerns? Yeah. Um, I really liked all your like, suggestions. I thought it was really comprehensive. Thanks. I have a question about something that you said in the beginning. Sure, what's up? So you said that most people don't have a high school diploma mm -hmm. coming out of prisons. Do you know anything about GEDs? While in the prison system? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Uh, I believe all of them are uh, required to provide that. Uh, currently at the jail I work at, we no longer can give the test, but we can refer you once you leave. But unfortunately, like, the, it's just not congruent to help people fix that problem as well. So like best practice is they are getting at least GEDs? Hopefully, if they want to, right? That's another thing. Yeah. yeah. I was curious if you had any suggestions as to how to perhaps reach parents who may not be engaged or in a place themselves where they're having a hard time. Um, just any tips or suggestions? Um, unfortunately, no, I don't know anything. Um, because a lot of times these parents just don't care or they're just completely not president, don't even have custody a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, as we talked about, so many, um, you know, are in the foster system or just have neglect for some other reason. And that's why they ended up in this situation, a lot of childhood trauma. So that's why I'm really advocating, like, we have to just teach these kids how to be adults themselves, unfortunately, because there's not really another option. Yeah. I have a question. I just have a statement. Yeah. I, I just appreciate that you're talking about this. And for me, as a therapist in training, it feels like an important social, social justice thing to know about. And yeah. I like, it did feel hopeless. <laughs> and I liked how you really stated some things that we could do. Cool. And the alternative school improvements, I really, mm -hmm. it just feels like we put a lot of thought into that. And Thanks. I, um, I guess I'll just be paying attention to this on a little level too. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys.